All right, welcome. So we have another WCET one-on-one -on -one interview today, and I'm really, really fortunate to have grabbed a little bit of time from Jessica Williams. She's our director of the Every Learner Everywhere Network, which is a huge initiative that is a grant-funded project, and I'll have her tell us a little bit more about it. So Jessica, welcome. Hi, Megan, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I'd love to talk about Every Learner Everywhere. Every Learner Everywhere is a project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates, and we represent a network of organizations that focus on digital learning and online learning. And our focus is specifically around the implementation of high quality digital tools and high quality learning experiences that um, help to close and reduce um, achievement gaps, particularly for low income students, students of color, and first generation students. And tell us a little bit about ba your background. You come to us with a pretty rich background as well as being very familiar with how to navigate through learning and homeschool learning because you have several children. Yes, uh, there's so many um, different aspects of my background, but um, educationally, um, I'm actually a scientist. So I did my undergrad and um, my graduate work in molecular biology. Um, so I have a PhD in that. Um, so I, I have a pretty extensive background in bi um, scientific research. So I, I kind of approach everything with that lens and it's been very useful to me. Um, I also have a pretty extensive background in student success work and um, particularly focused on um, academic success for students of color and low, low income students and first generation students. Um, I've done a lot of work. I've, prior to this role, I worked at Georgia State University in the Office of Student Success and I also did work with the University Innovation Alliance. Um, where I served as a fellow and did a lot of work around um, thinking about issues of um, completion and what students need to, um, as they, they finish that final push, that getting them over that edge and some of the challenges that they face to actually complete. This work is a little bit different in that I'm focusing more on the first year. So the courses that students take when they're first enrolling in school, which we call gateway or foundational courses. We know that these are the courses that historically um, are, are very indicative of how well a student does throughout the entire, their entire educational careers. So typically if a student doesn't do well in their preliminary or gateway courses, the chances that they're, they'll actually finish or graduate are much lower. And so it's really important when you think about um, improving success rates that you focus here. Um, and what our network does is to leverage the digital tools um, that our, our community is, you know, really pushing out and, and inventing and creating to um, promote success in those courses. One thing that we've learned is that the tools in and of themselves, just the technology, um, doesn't really do much. There isn't much, you know, to the technology, but what really um, impacts outcomes for our students is the high quality implementation of the digital, digital tool and the high quality um, implementation of the online learning environment. And so we like to marry the tool with really good solid pedagogy that puts this learner at the center. Um, and so, you know, that, that's what I'm doing now and um, kind of how I got there. Great, well, thanks so much for sharing that. And as we talk about online learning and good pedagogy, there's a lot to unpack there as Many, many of our institutions have been faced with putting their courses on an online format, which really for most of them has been remote learning where they just take what they're doing and they had to shift quickly because of COVID. And that's what we're both dealing with with our elementary students that they're doing remote learning, which isn't really developed online pedagogy with effective use of tools. So talk a little bit about what some of the experiences you've seen from students, especially first generation students that have suddenly been forced into this environment, as well as what institutions are grappling with? It's been really, really difficult, I think, for a lot of students. Um, I think one of the things I've heard the most is that it's just so hard to stay motivated. One thing that we know about first generation students, students of color, um, is that, you know, community is so critical. Community is important and it really, helps to keep students focused and to keep them going and when you strip that um, from them it is very hard to just stay motivated and stay engaged um, the skills that it takes to learn online 
are very different than the skills that it takes to learn in a classroom. You know, you have to be self-disciplined. You have to be self-motivated. You have to be organized. You have to be comfortable communicating in writing. Um, because when you're in a classroom and you don't understand, you can just raise your hand and ask a question. When you're online and you don't understand, then you have to reach out differently. Um, and so I think we have to take that into consideration. And I think even for our students, they have to realize that it's not just as simple as, you know, I was on a campus taking a class and now I'm online taking a class and it's the same. And if I don't feel as connected, then that's somehow my fault or, you know, I'm doing something wrong um, because it's easy to kind of also internalize some of that and feel like everyone should just be able to do it. And sometimes that's the message that we're sending out is just like, you know, well, it's the same thing. You should just be able to do it on a computer. And I just think that's not the case. Um, and I think the second thing just that, you know, we have to keep in mind is like the skill sets needed to study and to learn online are things that may need to be developed for some of our students. Um, and so that's another thing that I think we have to be sensitive to and um, support our students around. So, you know, this has just been a really difficult transition um, for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Um, you mentioned that, yes, I have four online learners with me in this house. I have four children and they're all struggling to learn online and I'm also struggling to support them. And so it's been a challenge for me as well. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of those tools that you've used to help support yourself as well as your four learners? You know, we're learning as we go. Um, and so I think, you know, setting, setting a schedule has been important. Um, you know, making sure that the, that my, my daughter, particularly who's, you know, older, she's 13 and she's having to, you know, take geometry and, you know, out pre-algebra and things online and, and learn some context steps that are a little bit more difficult. I think I'm having to coach her in how to reach out and when to reach out for additional help that that doesn't that didn't come naturally for her um sometimes i would find her not understanding things not getting things right on her homework and i'd say you know did you reach out to your teacher and she'd say no why would i do that i can't do that and so i think again that goes back to like you know we take for granted um that our students just get it and they know how to you know snap into this and they know how to get help um, and, and that's not always the case. Um, I think creating a quiet study space, creating a quiet study space is important. Um, and making sure that you have all of the technology that you need, but also the things that are not technology related, right? Like having a pencil, having a pen, having a place to work, having your things organized, all of that is important. So those are just some of the things that we're, we're learning. Yeah, I was sort of at my wits end a few weeks ago and I ran into a friend and she has three kids at home and of varying motivation levels and, and grades. And she gave me some tools that we implemented that have worked pretty well. But uh, if, if things move into the fall in a similar way, I think it's gonna be really, really challenging. It was one thing to say, we just needed to get through the end of the school year, but knowing that we might have a brief stint during the summer and then have to resume, we're really gonna to have to put some different things into place for our household to operate effectively, especially in juggling a full-time job. So knowing that, and <clears throat> we're all in, we're all struggling. And it, one thing that I found striking was that there's data out there that every single one of our students are gonna enter campus with some sort of mental health crises. They've either just graduated and they didn't get to say goodbye to their friends, or they had planned to work during the summer and earn some money, and now they're not getting started on the right foot, or they had to stop out and deal with some struggles, so including food insecurity or housing insecurity. So knowing those things, knowing that our institutions have to be ramped up and have really effective outreach and student services, what are some tidbits that you can give our institutions for really how to empathize with these students and maybe some resources that are available. I think that's a great point, Megan, and you're spot on. And I think the added point to that is that we're also hearing that, you know, COVID-19 is impacting our communities of color at a higher rate than, um, you know, any other communities. And I can see that even just in my own experience. I mean, I, I, there is not a day that goes by that, 
either someone who I know directly or who I'm, you know, maybe one person removed from is losing someone that they love dearly, a mother, a father, a friend from COVID-19. And that has grave implications, I think you're right, on, on public health. And in addition to that, we're also hearing, you know, the economic Im implications that are coming from this. So not only are people losing loved ones, but they're losing jobs and they're losing scholarships and their parents are losing jobs. And, um, you know, that, that, again, has grave implications on higher ed. And you're right, mental health. And so I think um, two pieces of advice that I would give. One is that, um, you know, we, we all have to, on some level, check our privileges, right? Like we're all privileged in some way. You know, it's not just a race thing. It can be a class thing. You know, it can be a gender thing. It can be a, you know, um, citizenship thing. You know, there are all things that we just take for granted as people. And I think that we have to really take stock of that. What am I just taking for granted, right? And it could just be the fact that I'm not worried that ICE is going to come in my door and take my children away from me at any given time, right? That's not, that's, that's a privilege. That's something that, you know, other people experience that I don't. Right. And I think that we, we have to just check that constantly, especially as we're engaging with other people and making decisions. And I think the other thing that's going to be important for our institutions is to not just measure success by intent, but to actually measure success by impact. Because I think we all have really good intentions. Right. We really want want the best but we don't do a good job always of actually measuring whether or not we have made positive impacts on the people who really need help and support and judging ourselves on that criteria. It's not good enough anymore for us to want the best for students of color, right? Or want the best for first generation students or want the best for low income students. Like I think we have to actually make sure that the policies and the things that we're implementing and the changes to our curriculum and the course design is actually effective for all of our students. Right, and knowing the population that the grant is focused on, there, there are measurable impacts to improving student success and retention there and across the board, but um, I'm sure that you say, you share the same fear and hesitation that all of us have as we're taking in these learners that maybe had a a less than stellar experience with online learning their senior year and then they're graduating and they're really grappling with does it make sense to invest does it make sense to take time away from my family and maybe picking up full-time work instead of going to school and and getting an experience that is not what it was packaged as when I decided I was going to go to college yep. yeah so I I worry about that. I know that that keeps many, many of us up at night in higher ed. But what are some strategies that you would share with students as they're trying to navigate moving from you know, what was remote learning for their final semester of high school into what could potentially be realistically online learning for their first year of college? I think the first piece of advice that I would give students is to you know, really genuinely do what's best for you. You know, I think that, that um, it's easy to tell someone, you, sh you know, you should go to school, you should do this, you should, but I think that students really have to take stock of, you know, what's best for them given all of the things that they have going on. I think it is I think this is, again, where that privilege piece comes in sometimes. I think that students, a lot of students have a long list of things that they have to worry about, and online learning may not be at the top of that list, and that's okay, you know, and you're not a bad person for that, right? I think at the same time, I would argue, I mean, I would, I would advise any students to not forget, though, what, what's important to them and not lose sight of their dreams. You know, and so what I mean by that is even if you have to take a semester and work, even if you need to take a semester and stay home, even if you need to take a semester and take care of your kids or you're nervous about sending 
your toddler to daycare and, you know, all of those things. Um, don't lose sight of what you want. If you still want to get that degree, you know, continue to think about ways to progress forward. You know, um, even if it means taking off a semester, don't quit, don't drop out altogether, go back the following semester. Talk to advisors about, you know, what you need to do. Is there a way that maybe you could take one course instead of all the course? You know, I, I think just, just be willing to be flexible um, in how you move forward, but never lose sight of, you know, your overall goals. I think that would be, you know, one piece of advice. I think, I think that would be my only piece of advice right now. Yeah. I mean, I think that we're, we're at a place where, yeah, people have to start making decisions that are, are good for them. And I think that we have to encourage people and empower them to do that. Yeah. And it's so difficult to make any decisions right now, not knowing what the fall might look like. And I know we're struggling with that as an organization and we're struggling with that as a family. But um, at the end of the day, you just, you just have to move forward with some sort of plan based on what you know now and what feels right for you and your, your family. And I think just accepting that it's okay if what you thought was going to happen doesn't happen right yeah. now. You know, like, I think I'm we've got to, to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Even like, even just for younger students, like I think about, like you said, students who are just graduating and we're excited about going to school in the fall and being on campus and getting away from home and all of those things, you know, um, even if that doesn't look like what you thought it was going to look like, you know, that's okay. Continue to push forward and make the best of the situation that you're in. Um, but I know it's disappointing. I mean, we're all, we're all experiencing that disappointment and that loss in our own ways. Yeah. Yeah. You, you said that really well. It's disappointing. And you, when you finally set your aspirations and you don't see a lot of movement, it can be really disheartening. But like you said, just getting some sort of traction and never losing sight of that goal. And for many of our students, a lot of our students are older and they realize they don't have a lot of time, but for students that are, you know, 18, 19, they have time to figure mm -hmm. this out um, in, in more incremental steps. So I think your guidance is very sound. So, well, we're, I don't wanna to take too much of your time. We're kind of wrapping up here, but do you have any final advice for our community, whether that's the students that are gonna to listen to this or advisors, academic leaders? Yeah, I mean, I think the only advice that I would have is certainly to just put a plug in for every learner everywhere. Like I said, our focus is really, you know, I, I think it's important to point out that what happened in the spring, right, was not, not um, the high quality online learning that our network is, um, is so strongly believes in. And, um, you know, for reasons that were outside of everyone's control, we all had to, everyone had to move online very rapidly. But I think it is still important for us to come back to ensuring that every single student has a high quality, quality learning experience in every single class. And I don't think we should lose sight of that or forget that. And just because we're moving online in a lot of cases, doesn't, that's no excuse for us to not be able to provide that. So, you know, if you're also interested in that or you'd like more researches or information, about you know how to deliver those high quality online courses to students, definitely check out Every Learner's website um, and we're happy to share resources and provide more information. Great, thank you so much. And I know that there will be a lot of people looking for creative ways to offer assessments and measure quality. Online learning can be very, very good. And there's, it's known that there's not a huge difference between learning outcomes with good online pedagogy. And, and Absolutely. Well, good. Well, Jessica, thank you so much. Stay well and good luck managing the rest of the school year with your children. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Same for you.